and welcome to Stories of Resilience, our podcast series to promote an ace-aware nation in Scotland. Adverse childhood experiences touch us all in one way or another. This series explores the thoughts of those involved with the ACES movement in Scotland and we talk to individuals who have stories of resilience to share. I'm delighted to say my guest today is John Carnican, co-founder of the Violence Reduction Unit and he is a passionate, passionate advocate of the public ACES movement we are seeing and experiencing right now in Scotland. In this story of resilience, John reminds us of the history of adverse childhood experiences in Scotland and his vision and hope for the future. So, John, it's good to speak to you again. Thank you for being a guest on Stories of Resilience. Um, I'm really interested to uh, to hear your your view from a, a an historical point of view, because just to remind people, or maybe make people aware for the first time, it was I think was it 2005 when yourself and Karen McCluskey established the Violence Reduction Unit uh, in in the west of Scotland. How did that How did that come about, John? Yeah, it's interesting. Though I'm now at that age, Gary, where, where people are more interested, interested in my institutional memory than my future's thinking. But anyway, that, that's another story. I'll live with that. It's, um, it's um, yeah, 2005, I was deputy head of the CID in Strathclyde, and Karen was the principal intelligence analyst. And together, we, we came across and re, a realisation that at the levels of violence that we had, uh, particularly in the west of Scotland, but in Scotland in general, were far above what was normal. Um, and so the then Chief Constable, Sir Willie Ray, he said, look, let's, let's think about this in an entirely different way. Let's not think of it as just about more cops in the street and, and longer sentences. Actually have a look at, take time to examine the issue of violence. And that's really how it started. And so after that, it really became just well, for me as a, as a detective officer, it was just a journey of following the evidence. For Karen, as a principal uh, intelligence analyst and forensic psychologist, uh, she was looking at the research and the evidence base that was there. And when we combined those two, we, we arrived at some uh, uh, startling evidence around um, public health and, and looking at violence and framing violence as a public health issue. And when we did that, it became far more easier to describe the challenges we faced, far more easier to understand um, perhaps the, the, the causes of violence. And of course, public health at its very heart has prevention. And so we, we were able far more to think about prevention. And, and I suppose that was, the, that was the biggest contrast for us because up until then, as a criminal justice organisation, all we thought about was detection and prosecution. Our, 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 our notion of prevention was limited to preventing people breaking into houses by putting alarms in the houses and bars on the windows. It, 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 the, the idea of actually preventing antisocial behaviour or preventing violence was really quite new. So it was, for us at the time, it was really exciting. Well, certainly for me, because it was, it was something I had never thought about before. At that time, I had about 30 years police service, just short of that. Uh, I was ready to go. Uh, I was ready to retire and then decided, no, I'm going to hang on because this is far too interesting. So that, that, that's how it came about. The public health thing took us into the idea of prevention. And then once we started looking at that, all the other avenues opened up to us. And how did you come across ACEs? Well, we, when we started looking at primary prevention, um, we, we discovered some work that had been done that said um, primarily that people don't learn how to be violent. They learn how not to be violent. And so the early years then became incredibly important. So we, we, in those early years, we found the research, uh, accepted research now and, and uh, 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 acknowledged wisdom that says that the first four years of a child, or the first three years of a child's life, first four years of a child's life, sorry, up to age three, are the most important in their life. Um, if we think about Jesuits speaking about giving the child until they're seven, and I'll give you the man. I mean, all the all the acknowledged and accepted wisdom was around that importance, because in those early years, humans start to establish uh, and, and 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 learn about communication. Um, they learn how to communicate, to negotiate, to compromise. These are all non-cognitive skills. These are not skills that you know you learn necessarily in a classroom. 
they're learned they're learned at home, they're learned by modeling of adults and what happens around them. And we learned that that humans, because that's the first time too that we spoke about and we met Suzanne Zedai, where we learned that idea of connection. And so that you know, children are born and babies are born connected. And biologically, we are, we're programmed to seek connection everywhere we go, all through our lives. And so when that connection is broken, it becomes a real challenge for us. And so when I started to think about this and think about the people that I had been dealing with over my 30 years that people had been arresting, most came from poor areas. Most came from, you know, the violence of the, of the son and the family wasn't the only issue. There was other issues around that that, that uh, people were struggling sometimes, just coping with, with their, their poverty, just, you know, just coping with everyday life. And so we started to think about primary prevention and said, well, okay, if we, if we have to, if we think that that's where the, the art begins and what's happening there. And it was at that point that we found uh, the, the, the research by Vincent Felitti and Anda that spoke about adverse childhood experiences and the impact they have through an entire life course. Um, and, and the evidence, well, for me, it was just, I thought, this is startling. I said, obviously, you know, I, I thought, people obviously don't know about this because if we knew about it, surely we'd be doing something about it. Mm-hmm. Surely there would be, I would have heard of this before. Surely, we, in speaking, it, you know, we, we, we'd have heard about this. And so we, we were members of the World Health Organization. It was through then that we, 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 we met Vincent Felitti. We brought Vincent Felitti to Scotland in 2007. Um, we, we started talking about ACEs in 2005, six, and never stopped talking about them, continued to speak about adverse childhood experiences, toxic childhoods, the, Im- the impact of that on, on children throughout their life course. And it, what was really, what I found now in reflection was quite telling, was that as a police officer, I was standing in stages and, and, and auditoriums and in conference theatres and, and different venues around the country, and, and not just to this country, I learned lots of countries, and speaking about this and speaking about the connection. And I was speaking to other police officers, to social workers, to teachers, to doctors, to midwives. I was speaking to a whole range of people. And I was always waiting, always dreading the moment that someone would put their hand up and say, excuse me, that's nonsense. That is nonsense because, and give me that. And Gary, in 12 years of talking about it, nobody, ever, ever, ever has advanced the notion that the science of adverse childhood experiences is in any way flawed. I, I, want, I want to ask, John, because uh, you made a very interesting point about uh, Dr. Felita coming, f- uh, what, 10, 11 years ago. Um, why, is, why has it taken that amount of time to get to where we are now? Because uh, I, I know that in your piece in The Herald that you've written, you talk about, yeah. I think the quote is, there is an ACEs movement now underway in Scotland. Is that yeah. 10, 11 years ago, you talk, why has it taken that period of time to get to where we are now, do you think? Gary, I wish I, I wish I could give you some definitive answer that I have confidence in its, its accuracy and veracity, but I, I don't. I, I suspect it's a whole combination of things. And it's a combination of perhaps we were, we were a bit misplaced with our excitement and a bit over-enthusiastic and optimistic because if you remember around that time, when we, when we established the Violence Reduction Unit, um, devolution, devolution had, had a cub. We had a parliament. It was Jack McConnell who was the first minister. And Jack McConnell and Cathy Jimison was the, the justice minister. We spoke to them at Butte House about our work in the violence reduction, about public health. about, And they said, right, we want you to do this throughout Scotland, not just in uh, Glasgow or, or the west of Scotland. We want it throughout Scotland. So that was, that was the first thing. And then there was a change in government in Scotland. And Alex Salmond became First Minister and Kenny McCaskill became Justice Minister. And we thought, oh, if, if things go the way not, things normally go with politicians, then we, we, we build, we'll just get back to our work in Strathclyde and forget. And, and it didn't. Kenny McCaskill, Alex Salmond, um, Nicholas Sturgeon was Health Minister, said, keep doing what you're doing. We want more of this. And so we were caught up in that notion of saying, well, here's a, here's a brand new parliament devolved in Scotland. A, a you know, a, a, an increasing sense of, 
of identity in Scotland and aspiration about doing the right thing. We spoke about the Nordic art. We want to do everything better. We want to make Scotland a fabulous place. In fact, we started speaking about making Scotland the best place in the world to grow up. We had Girfe getting it right for every child. We had curriculum for excellence. All of these, on the face of it, radical changes to what we were doing. And, and interwoven with us, we were speaking all the time about um, adverse childhood experiences. So Harry Burns at that time was chief medical officer. Um, Karen, Karen wrote a, a, a section in his first national report about violence. And we thought, we're on our way. This is it. But it never happened. It took a long, long, long time before even public health in, in Scotland established themselves uh, a, a hub. And it's great. I mean, I've met the people who are there and they're so enthusiastic and get it and they're driving it forward. But, you know, why did it, why did it take so long? And, and I, I don't know why it is. It may, be, it may be vested interests. It may be it was too difficult. It may be that we were too busy doing other things. It may be that we're just stuck and we don't, we don't know how to get ourselves out of this thing that says, look, let's go. But I think... I have a sneaking suspicion that we need to change our attitudes towards children in Scotland. And if we do that, other things will be possible. Because right now in Scotland, um, we're changing a bit, but I'm not sure we actually like kids. I think we tolerate them. All the way from the no ball game signs, we don't like kids playing, we separate them, we get them into school as soon as we can, and, and sometimes it's four and a bit. We're now testing them in P1, and you think, why? Why are we doing that? Where, it, where is the evidence that says all of this works? Where is it? Because when we were talking about adverse childhood experiences, we were saying, look, here's evidence that we know if these traumatic events happen in childhood, they will have a negative impact on an on, on individual's life course. It will affect our health services, our criminal justice services, our social services. It, so therefore, it's going to cost us more money. It will affect relationships in families and in communities. Therefore, you know, it will affect the very fabric of, of, of Scotland. So what... Why are we not doing this? And, and honestly, I, I wish I knew. I really don't know. You make a really interesting point there. And for some, it could be uncomfortable listening, particularly if you're a parent and, you, you know, you're saying, I don't think we, we like children that much in Scotland because yeah. you, you talk about the, yeah. the ball games. And I get, I get all that completely. Do you think yeah. that as a, the parents that are listening to this will put up a barrier and go, well, no, wait a minute, I love my child uh, with, with all my oh, heart. Yeah. I, do my, I do my best. Do you think that builds a wall towards the, the, the science around ACEs? Is it, is I, it I, people I, getting I, quite, yeah. quite obstinate about it? I think it perhaps does, but, but but I should be clear. I mean, we do love our own children, you know, and and we love our next door neighbours' children, and and we we probably quite like the kids who go to toddler group or go to book club, um, or go to the nursery. But what I'm saying is, in in terms of national change, children we can still assault. You know, adults can still assault children and have an excuse, and it's okay to do it because it's lawful. There is not another group in our society anywhere that we can lawfully assault, and it's okay. It's just none. Mm. So if we like children, why is that? If we love our children, why is it that we think it's okay to violently assault our children? The people will say, oh, we're talking about smacking. Smacking is another word for assault. Smacking is just a way of making it a bit easier. You know, that's like saying a heroin addict is just a little bit merry or a little bit sad. And a drunk who's breaking your windows and strapping your car and punching your wife is just a little bit merry. We shouldn't talk this down. We should call it out for what it is. Mm -hmm. So if we really like children, we wouldn't do that. The non-age for children is still one of the lowest in Europe. You know, for criminal responsibility, it's still one of the lowest in Europe. We, we set up... We set up um, in 1964, I think, the Colbrandon Report reported about children in the criminal justice system. And as a result of that, we established the Children's Panel System, Social Work Scotland Act. I think it was 1967, even though it was before my time, I should say. But they set that up. And what they said at the essence of that was that we, when, it, when children misbehave, when children commit crime, when children are antisocial, when children are not, if they're, if they're doing things that we don't agree with them are wrong, we should look at their need and not the deed. Now, that's, that's the phrase. That's where it came from. The need, their need, and not the deed. 
And here we are. That was 1964, the report. 1967, the Social Work Scotland Act. Here we are in 2018, and we are still punishing children. We, 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 see the, we see the behavior. We don't see the child. And I think what ACES is doing, ACES has given us a language, the same as health gave Cam and I a language to speak about violence. ACES has now given us a language to speak about these things to understand a bit more. And if, we, if, we're, if we're still a bit unsure about the evidence, then just think of one group of young people in, in our society. Think of children who have care experience. Care experienced children in their adulthood and in their teenage years are misrepresented and are, are, are disproportionately represented in the prison population, in the homeless population, in addiction, in the suicide, it's horrific, the levels. I mean, I think it's 67 or 68% of the population in Berlin are pain experience. Because we haven't understood the trauma. Young children have been removed from the families because they're at risk. The, the overwhelming majority, like in the 90% of the young children who are in, care, uh, in some measure of care, are there because of something that's happened to them, not of anything they have done. And yet when we take them into our system, we further traumatize them and we do not deal with the trauma that they're going through. That's why we've got so many young people and uh, uh, care experienced young people in prison, so many care experienced young people homeless, having poor relationships, not living good lives it's because of what happened to them in their family. But more importantly, that's been made worse by the system that we've subjected them to. And, and so I think that's why the independent care review right now is hugely important. And let's see how radical we're going to be. If we really do want Scotland to be the best place in the world to grow up, there's a group, of, there's a group in our, our society that we have failed. We have failed them collectively for decades, despite knowing the evidence that's there. The system has failed them. Now, of course, people within the system will become very defensive and say, oh, there's lots of young people have lived here. Of course there are. There are great foster parents. There are great people, uh, great social workers. I know some people like that. But all of that doesn't matter when we're failing young people. How many times do we need to read about a child dying at the hands of a parent or dying at the hands of a caregiver? And then when we have the review, we say that the problem was we didn't share evidence. We talk about system stuff. And we need to get by that. We need something radical. And I think that will be the test for us. That will be the test. The First Minister said she wants to do something about it. Well, let's do it. If we really want Scotland to be the best place in the world to grow up, then let's do it. What is stopping us doing it? Just let's get on and do it. John, there were some very tangible results that came from the Violence Reduction Unit. I remember we spoke about this at length in a previous podcast with Suzanne yep. Ziedike. And um, I... I remember driving in Dundee a couple of months ago, just at the back of the the tragedies that the, there was a series of uh, violent crimes, knife crimes in 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 London, and you were talking to Jeremy Vine on Radio Two, and you were very robust with I thought with Jeremy Vine uh, for a number of reasons. Yeah. And if I remember rightly from the interview, what struck me is that you were at, you were at great pains that that we should be talking not necessarily about knife crime but violence. Am I am I right? Yeah. With that, yes, absolutely, yeah. yes. yes. Uh, and the other fact was that you 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 took him to task about the media's role in all this, and yeah. and and how we report uh, and how how media reports. Um, mm -hmm. I, I get that. I get. I get that. Did, did, uh, and. Uh, <laughs> I got the feeling that they were almost looking to you and to the work that had been done in Scotland in order to perhaps adopt a similar stance down mm -hmm. south, but it just doesn't seem to be happening. It, you know, if, if, if decision makers and people in power can see the, the work and the results that have been done in Scotland, why do you think it's not being adopted down south? Oh, <laughs> lots of reasons. I, 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 and, and like the reasons for the 80s up here, I suspect, and that's why I think it's perhaps to do with vested interests and the gangs that are the real problem are the gangs of police and social work and political parties and, and education. Separate gangs, professional gangs, protect their own, first of all, their own language, they think they're the best. Um, their, their funding is ring fenced. The idea of working together is, well, OK, we'll do it if you give us more money. That's what it's about. And, and there's, there, we've, we've lost the plot a little with that. And in relation to London... Um, 
Tam and I have been at the Home Office several times. Theresa May, when she was Home Secretary, sat in the Manager of Unit Office and spoke to us and spoke to young men from gangs that we were working with. So the idea that people don't know what to do is absurd. Several months ago, the Commissioner for the Metropolitan Police and the Deputy Mayor of Responsibility for Crime was up in Scotland and we spoke to them as well. I've been in London and met with Jeremy Corbyn and spoke to Jeremy Corbyn and Sadiq Khan and Diane Abbott. So they know exactly what we've done. And what they're doing is going through the tick in the boxes routine. Say, yeah, we're looking to Scotland and we're, we're talking about public health. All they're doing is talking about it. And that's why I think this is different with ACs this time. Because we did all that up here. Mm. But at the same time as we were doing it with violence and talking about it, we were actually doing something about it on the ground. We were speaking to people like Jimmy Wilson, who runs FEAR, which is an organisation out in the East End of Glasgow. We were speaking to head teachers. We were speaking to housing officers. We were actually doing it. So the change didn't wait on some big strategy and plan and policy and politicians saying it's okay to do it. We were actually doing it. And I think that's what's happening with ACEs. We're not waiting and somebody saying, right, we're going to do something about this. We will write this fabulous 10-year strategy because we've got loads of smart people and all they do is write strategies. We'll think of a great policy because it'll soon be an election time and we'll need a clever policy. Meantime, thousands of people up and down Scotland have watched the film Resilience. They've listened to Suzanne and Tina Hendry and James Doherty and, and, and the women from the ACs hub, uh, Sarah and, and, and our colleague. They, they've listened to me. They've listened to Green. They're listening and they're listening more importantly to each other. And the message that's getting taken away is one of hope. The message is one that we don't need to wait. We don't need permission to make children's lives better. We don't need permission to do the right thing. We just need to get on and do it. And that's how I think the ACEs is a movement. It will change from the bottom up and the inside out. Because before we were trying to fix the whole system, politicians want whole system change. And that is really difficult. And I don't think it's possible because I think systems change at an individual level. So the individuals who inhabit and work in these systems, they'll push the boundaries a little bit. They'll change it a little bit and they'll make it better. And before we know it, the politicians and the leaders uh, uh, and capped will, and, and, and inverted commas will, will follow on from that. And I think that's the difference. Because the danger is that what happens with these systems is they start, they adopt something and they change it to suit the purpose of the system. And it's happening with ACEs. Because I hear people now speaking about ACE scores. What's your score? Now, the reason they'll do that is they'll say, well, someone's only scored three, so we'll give them X services. In order to get Y services, you need to have scored five or more. In order to get services at all, you need to, and we'll start to do that with it. And it's not about the score. It's about the trauma that's happened which is the experience. We want to prevent the experience happening. So we, it, that system will start to adopt it and change it to itself and say, we're already doing that. Oh, we, oh, no, oh, no, we're very ace aware. We understand it, yes, because we score it. Yeah, but what are you doing about the trauma to the children who are there? What are you doing to prevent the trauma? What are you doing to alleviate that trauma? And what are you doing to repair that trauma? That's the questions. Not what the ACE score is. Mm. Not how many people with an ACE score of three do we have? How many people with an ACE score of above seven do we have? That's, that evidence is there to tell a story. It's there to design and help us think about how we might design the best practice for that. It's not the practice in the end in itself. And practitioners need to do that. And mums need to do that. And dads need to do that. And that's the important thing with us. And we'll need to fight against it. We can let the system catch up. But in the interim, it needs to be about people, ordinary people, talking about this. And I think that's why, you know, awareness sounds like a very negative verb. You know, it's one of those things, well, yes, I'm aware. But, but the truth of the matter is, we need to let people hear this direct, not hear it from the folk who run the systems. Or oh, here's what adverse childhood experiences mean for your baby. We, people need to understand what we're talking about. And, and when they do, and they hear it in a language that they understand, they know what they're talking about. Now, I don't think you would need to tell anybody that a baby who's living in poverty, whose mum doesn't have enough to eat, or whose dad is violent, who, or who can't heat the house, do you actually need evidence? Do you need some research somewhere? Do you need some scientist to tell you that's not a good thing for a baby? For goodness sake. We, don't need, we shouldn't need evidence for that. And that's what we're talking about. When we talk about, you know, we need to, we need to build a great future for our children. Of course we do. 
We need to build a great present for them as well. That's what we need to do. Well, John, I suppose my final question is we have um, the, the two-day conference and um, yep. uh, and it almost sounds like it's an opportunity to, this may not be the right phrase, and I'm sure you'll tell me if it's not, but almost draw a line in the sand in order just to keep, just to really almost relaunch ACES yep. in, in Scotland. Yep. So we yep. have the two-day conference. It goes very well, which it will. We've got some of the best speakers and some of the best minds around this. What do we need to do? The conference, I suppose is the start of what we need to do. How do we keep the momentum going from September the 26th onwards? Because I think if, we, if, everyone, if, if everyone who comes along at that conference goes out and speaks to two people about it, and it doubles it, and every one of them go and speak to two people, and that's how we start to change this. And we need to be relaxed about the, the, the idea of, of um, what it's going to be, because that's a systems thing. Because we'll say, OK, uh, um, what, what will the strategy look like? What will our goals be? What will our achievement be? What will our outcomes be? How will we measure this? How will we get... That's, that's absurd. So let's not get caught up in that stuff. You need to trust that giving people the right information and they'll do fabulous things with it. They'll do great things with it on their own, whatever they do. If we look at the independent care review and it, it reports back, we need to accept that immediately about how it re- how it deals with trauma, and we understand the trauma of these care kids. That's something that's at one end of that, the, 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 the most difficult end of what we're talking about. We'll look at, at, you know, if we need services in terms of child, adolescent, mental health services, we'll be asking ourselves, well, why is it that children need more services? I mean, it's like the system right now, for instance, in health, the question that's always asked is why, you know, the, the target is four hours waking time in an A&E. Now, why is the question not asked, why are so many people going in A&E? And it needs to be the same with mental health. We need more, we need more child and adolescent mental health because, well, why do we need that? But, and we, we, we're talking about primary prevention. We're talking about pe- children having good lives and making good decisions for themselves. It's what we're talking about. So that's what it will be. It will be how we change things around. How, and these things will just, once people are aware, I mean, I think the classic might be... Um, if you think about it from policing, um, Police Scotland have embraced this. They want a division, a whole police division, which is going to be Asia, to become ACES aware. And from that, we'll begin to understand how police can do their business more effectively, as efficiently, but do it in a way that doesn't, that, that, that takes account of trauma. So, for instance, um, if we've got a warrant to arrest someone, and we've had the warrant for a week or 10 days, and I know we used to have warrants for months at a time, then if we know they're living in that house and we know they're there and they don't work, um, why are we kicking the door in at five o'clock in the morning when the kids are still there? Why don't we wait till the kids go to school and then we do it so that we're not traumatising the kids as well, so that we're not doing that? When we, when we, when we find a, a young person running away from a care home, why don't we treat that a bit more dif- differently and understand it better? When we go to an instance of domestic abuse and we see a child there, what are we doing about that? How do we understand that? How do sheriffs understand that and lawyers and procurator fiscals when they're prosecuting these things? They just see a woman who was assaulted where, you know, we should be seeing a woman who was assaulted, but we should see a child who's been witnessing that assault. And if it was a soldier coming back from Afghanistan, we'd understand PTSD. It's exactly the same thing. So we'll, we, we will, we'll, our, our, our services will start to change and, and adapt and we'll make things better. We won't be able to fix this overnight. There won't be a plan that says by 2024 it'll all be sorted. There won't be. But we should be able to look back and say we're doing things differently. We should be able to look back and say, why did we do it that way? Why did we, why did we deal with it that way? Why did we take as many children into care when in actual fact we should have given services to the family and kept the family together? That would have been much better. It would have been more difficult. It might even have been a little more expensive in the short term, but in the long term, it would have been better. And so I think going forward, that's what we need. We need to be, Karen used to say to me that I needed to be more comfortable with ambiguity. Um, I mean, I, I was always quite okay with chaos, been a, been a, you know, investigating murders. But we need to be more comfortable with ambiguity. Systems don't like ambiguity. They like everything that's exactly that. And the people who occupy these systems, particularly at the top level, they, they think like that. And we need to, we need to be more human, and we need to relax a bit more 
and we need to think about connection and compassion and all of these soft words that, oh, that's very unprofessional. That's the stuff we need to think about. And I think, for me, there, there, there's a quote about hope from Vaclav Havel, and, and, and I think that sums it up for me. And it, he said that hope is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense regardless how it turns out. So I think helping children and reducing the trauma that children experience is, is the right thing to do, regardless how it turns out. But the science would tell us that the way it will turn out will be much better than it is right now. Much, much better. John Carnican, thank you very much indeed. Thanks for that, Gary. That was Stories of Resilience, celebrating individuals and organisations who are helping to make Scotland an ace-aware nation. Find out more about ACES and the Ace Aware Conference this September in Glasgow at www.aceawarescotland.com.